Well, good morning, Overlake. As Pastor Neely said, my name is J.P. O'Connor, and you can usually find me on a Sunday morning serving with the second graders with Ben Thomas. Uh, but my family and I, we've been attending Overlake for the past two years or so, and we really feel like we've found our home. So we absolutely love it here. We love the connections we've made. Uh, but for my day job, I'm a Bible professor, and uh, I have to let you know, when you tell people you're a Bible professor, you get only one of two responses, right? Either people hear you're a Bible teacher, and they want to exit the conversation immediately, right? They're like, oh my goodness, uh, I'm late to something. I hope I never see you again, right? <laughs> but my personal favorite response is, uh, you know, they find out you're a Bible teacher, and they hit you with the dark web conspiracy theory, right? So uh, this woman cutting my hair in rural Minnesota found out I was a Bible teacher, and she said, have you seen the latest History Channel special, right? No, I haven't. You know, what's, what's it about? And she said, the one about the aliens, right? And I'm thinking, I'm not sure what uniquely qualifies me uh, to share on this topic. And she asked, are we alone out there, you know? And in my head, I'm thinking, I'd really like to be alone in here. Um, <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. I actually introduced her to the one and only extraterrestrial who died for her sins, right? No, I, did, I, did, I didn't do that either. Uh, now that I think of it, that would have been a good idea. Um, but anyways, I'm so honored to be able to speak to you today on Romans chapter 6. Uh, we're going to begin by reading our scripture together. Then we're going to pray and dive into the meditation. So listen now to the word of the Lord. What then are we to say? This is Romans 6, 1. Should we continue in sin in order that grace may increase? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we might also walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Amen. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Would you pray with me? God, I ask this morning uh, as we meditate on your word, that we would receive freedom from the things that are holding us down. God, I pray for my friends in this room, my friends online who might feel like they're barely holding their head above the water. God, I pray that you would fill their lungs with your freedom and your fresh air. God, set us free. Help us to walk in the freedom you provide for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as you may have noticed from our reading in Pastor Neely's sermon last week, I have the distinct pleasure of talking with you today about the topic of sin. So exciting, right? Thank you so much, Pastor Neely, right? What could go wrong? Just, you know, give JP the sin topic. Uh, but I'm actually kind of excited. Um, if you read Romans 6 carefully, you might notice that the word sin appears 17 times. So imagine this with me for a moment. You're texting a friend or a loved one, and they repeat the same word 17 times, okay? What does that tell you? Either you should get out of that relationship as soon as possible, or that you really need to pay attention. Do I have any parents in the room? Do I have any parents of young children in the room? Okay, we know what it's like to repeat ourselves, don't we? Okay, uh, Inside voices, please, okay? Uh, your hands are for loving, not for hitting, sweetheart, right? Uh, this one's my personal favorite. I've been saying it a lot at home lately. Can we please flush the toilet 
when we're done so that the house doesn't smell like a toxic waste plant, <laughs> sweetheart, right? Um, has anyone else been there? Okay, you know what I'm talking about, but Paul, like a good parent, is repeating himself today. It actually might surprise us that Paul in his magnum opus Romans is talking at length about sin to a church he has yet to meet. Is anyone dating in the room? Is anyone on the apps? Okay. Let me give you some free advice. If you're on a first date with someone, don't bring up the topic of sin, right? What do you do for a living? Oh, you're a software engineer. And what do you think of sin? (laughs) The date is not going to go well, I promise. Uh, But this is exactly what Paul seems to be doing. He's going all in on the topic of sin to a church he has yet to meet. Why does he do this? Well, I hope to show you today that sin is a central tenet of Paul's theology. And really for us in this room, for us online, sin is a central tenet of Christian theology. So before we do that, before we unravel what that means, I want to show you this chart that Pastor Neely showed you last week. Does anyone get really jazzed about charts? God has a calling on your life, if that's true. Um, As you can see here, the word sin spikes in usage in chapters 5 through 8, but especially in today's chapter, in chapter 6. So pop quiz, what is today's sermon about? Say it with enthusiasm. (laughs) Here's what I want you to do. This is very playful. I imagine this is playful. Turn to your neighbor and just remind them gently that they're a sinner, okay? Um, Seriously. Some of you said that with way too much enthusiasm. You're the sinner. Gotcha. No, don't. Let's love our neighbors as ourselves, okay? But before we can uh, fully uh, dive into this, I want to begin with a brief overview of the structure of Romans. So I have a little graph on the screen. Uh, You may already know this, but Romans is divided into several major sections. We have chapters one through four. That was season one of our series. Now we're in chapters five through eight. Then there's nine through 11 and 12 through 16. So this section, Paul is fundamentally asking, what does it mean to be a human? Right? And when Paul asks that question, he's not talking about biology, bones, or blood vessels. For Paul, what it means to be human is, what does it mean to sin? How do we define sin? This is also why some have categorized Romans 5 through 8 as Paul's so-called ethics. Right? He's asking these questions about humans and how they relate to other human beings. We might phrase it like this. Paul's asking, how does a creature of God live in the world? And more specifically, what should the life of a baptized believer even look like? It's actually a fair and relevant question for us today. But I imagine for some of us in this room, we might have come in here with different definitions for the word sin. Like I imagine some in this room might have grown up hearing a preacher talk about sin every Sunday and you left confused, feeling guilty, or even ashamed about who you were. Others in this room, you might have a family member who loves to point out sin in other people, okay? We all have one of those. We sit far away from them at Thanksgiving, okay? Uh, Maybe you're in this room and the only thing you know about sin is the guy who stands outside of the Seahawks games or the Mariners games. Have you seen this guy? And he has a megaphone and he reminds us all that we're sinners before we go root for our favorite team. Uh, Regardless of where you are today, I want to say that each of those usages of sin is either half true or completely misinformed. And that's why I think it's important for us to start with a simple definition for sin. And really, in our Bibles, there's two working definitions for sin. The first is this, sin is an internal problem, okay? We might say this is a you problem. You done messed up, okay? You were playing football in the house, and you knocked over grandma's, you know, heirloom, and it fell on the floor and broke, and who's to blame? You are, okay? But the second definition is sin is an external problem. We might say this is a societal problem, a systemic problem, a Satan problem. In this definition, sin affects you. You might even participate in it, but it is much bigger than you. 
It's on a grand scale. You're just one sort of system or piece in a larger system. Now, famously, James chapter 1 defines sin according to the first definition, sin as an internal problem. James 1 says this, no one when tempted should say, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one, but one is tempted when, by one's own desire, they're dragged away and enticed. So sin, according to James, it's a you problem, right? There's this internal desire that's sort of controlling your body, and the author of James is saying, you know, get it in check. And this, I would say, is probably the most famous definition for sin that many of us have rolling around in our heads when we hear a sermon like this. Um, You know, sin compels you to act in a certain way, but what's one of the problems with this first definition is it can be misconstrued to say something is wrong with you, creature of God. This first definition is also not the definition Paul is working with in Romans chapter 6. It's certainly in the Bible, but for Paul, Paul's concerned with the second definition for sin in today's passage. And it's really on full display next week with Romans chapter 7. I mean, Paul cannot even control his own body, right? Sin is sort of using him like a marionette puppet. This is an external problem, right? Some palpable force outside of you seems to be controlling you. Let me explain it like this. Are there any DIYers in the room? Brave people, okay? Um, I personally am a DDIYer. Okay, that's a don't do it yourselfer. Okay, there are pieces of furniture in my house that are put together upside down and backwards and inside out. The kids know mom's in charge of putting the furniture together. Okay, uh, but if you're a DIYer, you, you might have done an art project and you had some paint on your hands. And picture with me scrubbing that paint off your hands. The paint never completely comes out off your clothes out in the wash. This is the work of sin. My sincere apologies to Sherman Williams, okay? This is the effects of sin. And for Paul, it's sort of like our favorite pair of jeans has sin on them, and it won't come out in the wash, no matter how much OxyClean we decide to use. Now, an internal definition, the first one, would say it's a production problem. You know, those jeans were made poorly. You know, it's not very strong fabric that they have, but that's not what Paul's saying. Paul's saying that you are okay creature of God, but you have a little sin all over you. It's not coming out. Sin is this pollutant that has gotten every waterway toxic and humanity is drinking out of it. Humans are not toxic. This is a very important distinction to make in Paul, but in Romans 6, We're made in the image of God, but we might be drawn toward toxic things. The letter of Romans, we might say, is Paul's best case that we as finite creatures of God desperately need God's help, right? Our fingers are stained with primer. Our genes are hopelessly ruined. We're running out of OxyClean. This isn't a mistake we made internally, right? It's not who you are as a person. Some need to hear that. We would never blame a prisoner of war, for example, for being held captive by the enemy. Humans, Paul thinks, are prisoners of sin in need of God's help. The scrub brush just isn't working. What does it mean to be human for Paul? He begins with a definition of sin, and for Romans, he's saying sin tells us we desperately need God's help. So I have a definition for us to work with. I'll have on the screen as we move forward. Hear me once more. Fault lies not with the one held in captivity, but with the captor. Paul thinks of sin as holding humanity captive. You're not the problem here. Sin's the problem. Paul sort of has bigger fish to fry, if you catch my drift. So now that we've defined sin, we're working with the same definition, we can move to the beginning of Romans 6 where Paul asks, does a baptized believer still sin? Right? Does a baptized believer still have paint stains on their jeans or on their fingertips after they've been washed in the blood of Jesus? 
And to answer these questions, Paul actually employs a very uncomfortable metaphor, the metaphor of slavery, to illustrate the life of the Christ follower. Let's turn to verses 16 through 18 of chapter 6, which say this. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either to sin which leads to death or of obedience which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who are slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become enslaved to righteousness. Now, when we hear these words, our mind should go to the very first line of Romans. In fact, you can turn with me there in your Bibles to Romans 1.1, where Paul says this, Paul, a what? A slave, some translations say servant, of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the good news. So this is how Paul begins most of his letters, but a lot of English translations have the word servant. In fact, out of curiosity, how many translations in the room say servant here in Romans 1.1? Yeah, more than a few. This is actually historically misleading, right? Paul is not saying, here, sign up for the worship team, that kind of servant, or, hey, you're a servant of the public. Paul is actually saying, as a believer, you're enslaved to God. And it's the primary descriptor Paul uses for himself. But for us, in this room, this metaphor is rightly jarring, right? Given the history of the United States and the treatment of black people in this country, this metaphor is sensitive and disorienting. In Paul's day, slavery was everywhere. It was in the marketplace, the workplace, at home, and the conditions back then were horrendous, with a few exceptions. And we see most famously in the book of Philemon, Onesimus, who's either presently or formerly enslaved, joining the family of God. But we also see this metaphor in almost every New Testament book. But some translations have the word servant so as not to sort of ruffle any feathers. A quick history lesson here. For modern people in the United States, we really must recognize that slavery language was abusively used by people who owned other people Christians no less, and it's important that we acknowledge that this is unequivocally evil, right? So when we see these metaphors in the Bible, we ought to think about the history of usage and how they've been used to harm, right? But we can also say with confidence that when Paul uses this metaphor, he actually intends the opposite. He intends liberty, hope, and freedom. So we ought to think about how these terms have been used. We mustn't ignore history, but we also should think about Paul's intention to bring hope, right, and freedom. So with this nuance in mind, I actually want to draw your attention to how Romans 6 ends. So turn with me to verse 23, the very last verse of the chapter. Paul says this, the wages that sin pays are what? Death. But God's gift is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we're thinking actually of enslavement here. Right, so Paul is not saying uh, sin is your employer. Paul is saying sin is your master. And what does sin pay as wages? Not manumission, not freedom, not even a living wage. Sin pays out its wages in death. Right, the employment metaphor breaks down. Right, humans don't get to choose in the sense of, well, I work for this company or that company. Paul is actually saying we're owned by one of two things. Either we're owned by sin or we're owned by God. There's no wiggle room here in chapter six. And I think this exposes another misnomer for us in Paul and maybe how we think about our freedom in the world today. Sometimes we have this idea that humans are free to do whatever they want, choose whatever employer they want, our career choices, how we spend our money, where we go in our free time. And Romans 6 really challenges this idea. Freedom, in maybe our modern sense, is like a God that we serve. And Paul says for us, you're actually either enslaved to sin or enslaved to God. He says this in verses 20 through 22. Let's take a look. 
When you were slaves to sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what fruit did you gain from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to who? To God. The fruit you have leads to sanctification and the end is eternal life. Right, so Paul here is reminding the church to whom they belong. That they're on the winning side and what we're going to get to by the end of our meditation today is that the seal of that promise is their baptism. We're going to save that for the end. So I want to take you a little deeper. Now that we've defined sin, I've given you a brief overview of Romans chapter 6. I want to hone in on just two verses. Okay, let's take a look at verses 13 and 14 of chapter 6. Paul says this, No longer present your members to sin as instruments. Can you guys say instruments? Instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. Now, does anyone remember puppets, okay, or puppetry, okay? For those who have forgotten, I have some pictures here on the screen, okay? Um, Jim Henson, of course, was the master puppeteer, uh, but when I was a kid, I was actually trained in the ancient, and some might even say dark arts, of puppetry, <laughs> okay? Thankfully, Pastor Tina still lets me use those skills every now and again, as one of the images will show, uh, but I love the magic of puppetry, Right, I love that something inanimate can talk. Right, building a backstory for the character, the narrative arc, right? Puppetry is art, okay? And Paul's image in Romans 6.13 so sort of sounds like puppetry, right? Paul's saying to his readers that they need to present their members as what? Instruments either to God or as instruments of sin. And forgive me, but I tend to think about puppets. Right? We can say it like this. Paul is essentially asking, who is puppeting you? Is that a verb? I don't know. I'm going to use it as one. Who's puppeting you? What are the things controlling the things you're doing? What's drawing your attention? What intrinsically captivates you? And here's what's interesting. A better translation of the word instruments is actually the word weapons. Now, I would never personally weaponize a puppet, okay? <laughs> but sometimes my kids uh, get a hold of the puppets and they go in the front yard and they sort of do the puppet wars, okay? <laughs> it's very fragile on the fabric. I wish they wouldn't, but <laughs> they sort of fight each other, right? And uh, Krista, my wife, thinks that we've permanently damaged our relationship with the neighbors because of this, but, you know, it's a mere difference of opinion, okay? So puppets can be used for violence, I guess. Uh, but Paul says the same of humans, that humans can offer their bodies as weapons to inflict violence upon the world or as instruments to bring life. Well, which kind of puppet are you this morning? Are you bringing life? Are you bringing destruction? Here's another analogy. It's way less cool than puppets. Uh, but think about a hammer, okay? I am told, in theory, that hammers nail stuff, okay? I feel very uncomfortable in Home Depot. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, but in theory, hammers are a tool that can build things, right? Or what can hammers be used to do? They can smash and break things. We can ask similarly, well, what kind of hammer are you? What are you building? Romans 6.13 defines the destructive power of sin for us, I think, in the clearest possible way. Sin has taken control of some humans for malicious purposes, right? We're, uh, we're humans becoming hammers, allowing ourselves to be used to smash up windows instead of building up houses. This is Paul's theology of sin. Jew or Gentile, rule follower or not, God wants the core of our instruments, our very hands and feet, to be in alignment with the loving and gracious creator. 
the image bearers of God need to go out and bear God's image. And when we do, we become instruments of this gracious and loving God, and our very bodies are not used as weapons of violence anymore, but they're used to rebuild, to restore, and to bring hope. So here's what I want us to do this morning. If you would indulge me, just hold out your hands just for a minute. You can close your eyes if you'd like. And I want you to think about these questions reflectively. Ask yourself, what are these instruments for? Why do I do what I do? Who informs how I spend money? Why do I jump on my phone after a tough conversation? What are these instruments for? Why do some of the things I do feel almost automatic? You can put your hands down. For those that close your eyes, you can open them. I like how Paul says it in Colossians 3.17. Paul says this, And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. If you're a puppet, who's puppeting you? If you're a hammer, what are you building? Who's the builder? If you're a consumer, what are you buying? And why are you buying it? What compels you to do the things with these instruments? And Paul tells us that a fundamental concept of what it means to be human is our total and complete reliance on our Creator. I want to close this here and invite the band back up in a moment. And I want to return to the opening lines of Romans chapter 6. And we're going to read them again together now that we've been given the full context and meaning of the chapter. Paul says this, Do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in newness of life. In the Christian tradition, one of the most beautiful illustrations of the Christian life is water baptism. And I would encourage you, if you feel God's leading, uh, to sign up for water baptism today. Hear me. Baptism is material proof that you belong to God. We'll have a QR code on the screen in just a minute. You're welcome to pull out your phone and sign up. But when we go down into the water, the use of our bodies as instruments of violence washes away. And when we rise out of the holy water, our very bodies become tools for building up God's kingdom. Remember those stains that were on our hands that were hopelessly ruining our favorite pair of jeans? Well, now they're suddenly taken away in the purifying water of God. Remember, Romans 6 is not addressing an internal problem of sin, and I think some need to hear this today. Nothing is wrong with you, friend. This is an external problem. It's the largest possible scale, and the act of baptism, what it does is it tells the world, you no longer belong to that thing anymore. You belong to God. And I want to close with one more image for you this morning. And it's actually one of my favorite images of all time. It comes from Disney and Pixar's Toy Story, which uh, I can't help but get excited when I talk about it because it's the greatest movie ever made. Don't at me, okay? You know the story in this scene? We see the bottom of a cowboy boot. Many of you should immediately recognize that as Woody the Cowboy's shoe. And we can see on the bottom of Woody's shoe, we have the name A-N-D-Y, Andy, written on the bottom. And if you don't know the story, Andy writes his name on the bottom of all of his toys. Now, if the toy becomes lost or misplaced or misshapen by Andy's evil neighbor, Sid, each toy will always and forever bear that name. It's Andy's name. 
One of my favorite parts about Toy Story is that Andy's toys belong to Andy no matter what happens to them in this life. And guess what? Nothing is wrong with them. That's not how the creator sees it. That's not how Andy sees it. As evidence of ownership, Andy's name is inscribed on the bottom of his toy's shoes. And in the act of baptism, we declare that we no longer belong to sin and death, but that we belong to God. We make this collective agreement as a body of baptized believers that God is the one who holds us captive. God is the one for whom we do our work. We may have been mistreated. We may feel like we've been misplaced or overlooked. But friends, this morning, check the bottom of your shoe. Whose name is on you? It's not the name of your employer. It's not the name of your most recent mistake at work. It's not your career choice. It's not the name of the first or the last person to harm you. Every baptized believer has J-E-S-U-S written on their lives. And the water in baptism is proof. Baptism, we say as Christians, is the indelible mark that you belong to God. And we understand fundamentally that we belong to God. Our humanity starts to work differently. It starts to work as God intended it to work. And the water washes away the marks on our hands and feet, our eyes and ears, where we formerly served the kingdom of greed or the kingdom of hate. We now have hands and feet, elbows, and kneecaps fresh with holy water that serve the kingdom of faith, hope, and love. So I'm here this morning to remind you to remember your baptism. I'm here to remind you to check the bottom of your shoe. I'm here to remind you to whom you belong. Would you join me in prayer? Feel free to hold out your hands as we pray. Before we pray, I just want to ask these same questions once more as you hold out your hands. If you're a puppet, who's puppeting you? If you're a hammer, what are you building and who is the builder? If you're a consumer, what are you buying? If you're a teacher, for whom do you teach? If you're a software engineer, for whom do you work and build? God, we pray in Jesus' name for our friends in here this morning. God, I ask that you would remind us to whom we belong. That the work we do, whether it's a nine to five, whether it's at home with our kids, wherever we go, our work is for you. God, I pray for those in this room that might feel torn. They might feel that they belong to someone or something else. God, may today be a reminder of our baptism of the water that washes us clean and a declaration to the world that we belong to no one else but you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, it's 
Good, good news. We belong to God. And the, I think the news keeps getting better because when we belong to God, we belong to one another. And there's such a beautiful promise in that we're not just one instrument. We're a collective of instruments together. And what we can do together is so beautiful. Uh, thank you so much, JP, for being with us this morning. Thank you for reminding us of the good news that we belong to God and reminding us that puppets matter. You know, like that was important for us. So thank you so, so much. So good. I want to uh, remind you that every week as you head out, there are people with lanyards on that have buttons on it that remind us that we have people that we can pray with. Uh, maybe today something stirred for you. There was something of like just a questioning of like, who do you belong to? And 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 what are, what is that? How's that showing up in your life? And you want to pray with someone. There is someone in the hall who will pray with you today. You just need to look for that white button and, and, and they'll pray with you. Write that in there. It will be beautiful. Uh, if you got the email this week, you heard uh, some big news that's happening here at Overlake in three weeks. We're making a little bit of move into uh, the chapel for main service. We'll be moving. The past few years, we've had some issues in this space that have made it a bit challenging for our tech team, our worship team, uh, sometimes our live stream. And we are going to close this place up and do some work in here and make it fix it up so that it's ready to go. But for those weeks that we're working in here, we will be having our main service in the chapel starting June 30th at 10 a.m. still. And here's the deal is um, it'll be good practice on sitting close together. You know, we'll learn how to sit a little closer together so that when we come back in here, we'll sit close together. It will be amazing. It will be amazing. Um, that will be the plan. So June 30th, that's coming. You'll, we'll, we'll keep telling you each week so you're ready. But June 30th, we'll spend about a month in there. It'll be a lot of fun, close, cozy, fun, and warm. Um, it'll be great. I would love to pray this blessing for you as you head out today. Maybe, again, since the hands was such a good reminder, why don't we open up our hands and receive this blessing? Now, Overlake, may we be reminded who we belong to. And may we live each day, every encounter, as an instrument of life, as an instrument of love, as an instrument of God's good news in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.